through. And once I get a, a confirmation that video is on, then we'll go live. And we are live. Hello, everyone in San Gabriel Valley and beyond. Um, my name is Levy Sun, and we're with the San Gabriel Valley Mosquito and Vector Control District. Today, we have a great topic here for you uh, regarding mosquito-free spring gardening. And we'll start off with some introductions. So I'm Levy, and let's go around my circle here. So we'll have go uh, with Pablo and then Anita. Hi everyone, my name is Pablo Cabrera, and I'm the communication specialist here at the district. Hi everyone, my name is Anita Lin, and I am the extra help outreach assistant at the district. Okay. And joining us today is Food Ed. Uh, so I'll toss it over to Kristen to talk a little bit about herself and a little bit of an elevator pitch of Food Ed. Yeah, so I'm Dr. Kristen Ritzaw, and I'm here in the San Gabriel Valley, located in Monrovia. And we are a nonprofit working with garden um, at schools and cities to reimagine what garden and food science can be. So we do steam garden education, community um, gardens, and we are, call ourselves educational landscapers. So we don't just come in with the plants and vegetables, but we want to make sure that people know how to have the healthiest, most sustainable drought tolerant um, environments that work with their ecosystems and can be sustainable. So we do education with K through 12 and really all ages because we're all kids at heart, right? So. <laughs> Absolutely. Yes. When you dig through dirt, you just, you know, it brings up the kid in you. Um, and some of you may be, may be wondering why we're partnering with Food Ed, so stay tuned. We'll, you'll hear more about that. If you're watching, you're watching live right now on either Twitter, Facebook, YouTube, or on our website. If you have any questions, please drop in a comment. If you're on our website, looking down below, there's a box right there for you to submit a question, and we'll field them as we go through this episode. And um, so back to the question that we sometimes get is why do we partner with some of the folks that we feature here at the Bite Back Tour? And to know that, we need to know a little bit about what we do as an agency here in mosquito control. But before we go there, um, I want to toss it over to Pablo to talk about some exciting things that have been happening this week. Um, Pablo, what's going on this week that's been causing a buzz? <laughs> well, uh, more like what hasn't been happening this week. Uh, it's actually been a very exciting week. Uh, Hopefully you're aware that it is California Mosquito Awareness Week this week, April 17th, all the way till the 23rd. So we're in the midst uh, of all of it. And some few things that I want to highlight that have been really exciting um, is when we kicked off our California Mosquito Week here at the district with Sacciolo, Mosquito and Vector Control and Instagram Live in English and Spanish, a great conversation. Um, and mainly I want to highlight to our incredible cities in our district so far, uh, we have six, and the City of Industry will be joining us next week uh, for Proclaiming Mosquito Awareness Week in their cities. So big thank you to all our cities, Monrovia, South Pasadena, Azusa, Alhambra, City of Industry, City of San Gabriel, and City of Edmonte uh, for proclaiming this in each of their cities. Levi, I know you've been hard at work at this and a little tired, but it's all worth it to get our cities uh, involved in proclaiming mosquito awareness in their cities. Absolutely. And I also want to point out the cool pins we're rocking today. Thank you to our friends at West Valley Mosquito and Vector Control District who shared those with us. Um, and a shout out as well to Coachella Valley and Florida Mosquito Control Association who did Instagram Live this morning and Greater LA as well, who is hosting their Twitter spaces right now. So if you're not watching this, you can also tune into their Twitter spaces as well. And all the cool stuff that all the other vector control districts are sharing. And thank you to all our partners who have been sharing all our content for California Mosquito Awareness Week this year so far. Absolutely, it's definitely an exciting week. It's also California Native Plant Week. So we're all about making sure people are aware of increase about improving biodiversity around their home using California native, native plants and just being smart about how they manage their surroundings and their outdoor space around their home. And in terms of what we do, in addition to raising awareness for education, we also set out traps in almost in every city to monitor for the presence of disease and mosquito abundance, which is how much how many mosquitoes there are in a certain area. And that data is then fed over to our operations team who then use it to better target where our resources go to manage the stagnant water sources. Usually it's in the public area. It's very difficult to get into every single backyard, 
But in those that we, and in the backyards we do get into, many times is to address any specific issues like swimming pools that have gone out of order or um, any other nuisance biting that may occur. But ultimately it comes down to mosquito management for everyone. Mosquito control is a shared responsibility. And by sharing that responsibility, you actually help create healthier bite-free communities in your neighborhood. And you also create and build healthier bite-free communities through the habits that you build into your daily life, including gardening. Um, and that doesn't always apply to everyone at every time because I know some folks don't think they can garden. Some people say they have, uh, I believe Christy mentioned once before, uh, brown thumbs where they just can't seem to grow anything. But today we're gonna hopefully dispel some of those myths and, and talk about how we can do uh, gardening around the home uh, while being smart about mosquitoes. So we have a series of questions here that we'll go ahead and ask you, Kristen, and let's begin. Oh, before we move on, if you're watching, this is the Bite Back Tour. Uh, we're broadcasting live on Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, and our website. Drop in a comment or question. And Kasson, uh, I see you're on Facebook. Hello, thank you for watching. And we start with our first question here. If a resident is interested in starting a garden in their yard or patio, when and what is the best way to begin? Yeah, great question. And I also want to point out, it's also Earth Day tomorrow. And it's yes. some people have adopted Earth Week and Earth Month. Yeah. So it's all the weeks this week. <laughs> so you guys have chosen a good week to do this. And next Friday is Arbor Day, too. So it's all the days, all the weeks. And in terms of all the days and all the weeks, today is a good day to start a garden, but also any time is really a good time to start a garden. We like to say to avoid January and August. Um, January, it's just, it gets a little bit too cold for those plants to get started unless you have a really controlled environment. Um, but in August, it's way too hot. So August is kind of our month where we get to kind of take some time off. But in terms of how to start, we recommend three different things. Um, sun, soil, and grow what you eat. And I'll go over what each of those points mean. But the first thing that you want to do is really check your sun. Um, there's a sun seeker app that you can get, but you can also just pay attention to where the sun's path goes. Um, south facing is best, but if you have a giant tree south facing, that's not going to be best to grow vegetables. Um, you know, there's some shade loving plants, but in terms of people that want to grow, um, vegetables, they really do need a minimum of six hours and really ideally a little bit more, especially in the warmer seasons. There's a myth out there that says, oh, I need some shade for my garden, especially when it's hot. Watering and good watering practices, which we'll get into a little bit later, is actually what keeps your garden cool, not necessarily um, shade. And so when you see your plants stressed out, Plants get stressed like people, they're living things. Uh, after coming off the last couple of years, we're all dealing with a little extra stress. <laughs> so yes, no the kidding. Plants can, um, the plants, if they look stressed, just give them an extra hit of water. So that's really what's going on there. Um, the other thing we like to emphasize is um, soil. And so if I can share my screen real quick, I'll share a recipe that we use. Um, One sec. All right. So this is from one of our community garden workshops. So this is, we, it's been coined as Mel's mix. Um, but, oh no, that little button is on the, there we go. Um, so yeah, so Mel's mix is one third peat moss. We've also been using cocoa core. Um, and so cocoa core is a little bit more sustainable, but it's a little bit harder to, to work with because you really have to get it well hydrated before you mix it in one third compost with at least five different things mixed in. Um, and then one third vermiculite or perlite. So people want to screenshot this. You can Google Mel's mix. It's very common in the gardening world, but I can't tell you how many people just go to a, you know, a big box store, grab a bag of soil and they're like, Oh, it worked for one year. Why won't it work again? So soil <laughs> is the biggest investment. I don't really care where you get your plants from. <laughs> I don't care what the plants are made out of or who grew them because it's really going to come down to what your plants are soaking up from the soil. And the last thing I would share is grow what you eat. So if you don't like jalapenos or you don't like tomatoes, then don't grow those things. Right. But if you love watermelon, try growing a really fun variety of watermelon, like an orange watermelon or a yellow watermelon. 
Um, take advantage of those seed catalogs where you can find really unique varieties of things. Uh, I'll get into tomatoes in a little bit, but tomatoes, people think are starter vegetables. They're not. <laughs> tomatoes can be really finicky, but if you love tomatoes and you want to invest in that, um, there's 10,000 different varieties of tomatoes. Wow. So grow a black tomato or a pink tomato. Um, we really get fooled at the grocery store thinking there's just a couple varieties of things. Yes. Um, and the, the last thing I would say, if you're starting is just know what season you're in. So I've got another slide here that talks about warm, hot, or cool season. So we're, we're just about to leave our warm season and into our hot season. So all your herbs you can plant right now, cucumbers, and then you're going to start all your tomatoes, squash, beans, corn. Um, and you can do that now it's getting hot enough in the day. They love heat. So just because it says winter squash, the winter squash you grow in the summer, you harvest when it gets cool. So if you start planting broccoli now, you're going to be really sad. You're going to have some really happy pollinators because it's going to go right to flowering. <laughs> so though, that's a lot. That was a lot of information, but <laughs> I will stop there. Yeah, But the beauty of all this is if you're watching, uh, you can always rewind back later to, to take yeah. snapshots of what Kristen shared. And the Mel's mix, um, those specific, uh, I guess you could say ingredients there, you can purchase them at any um, store. You can vermiculite. We've heard as with a lot of things right now that there's a little bit of a national shortage. So if you can't find vermiculite, perlite is those things that look like styrofoam. And when I was very first starting to garden 20 years ago, I thought it was styrofoam. <laughs> it's not styrofoam. It actually helps with drainage in the soil. So that makes it fluffy and light and makes those roots be able to move and the water move through. So um, perlite is another substitute for vermiculite just for the lights. Um, it's on aisle one at Home Depot, if anybody's <laughs> as much of a nerd as I am. Uh, but, yeah. well, it's so great you have this kind of knowledge. Um, we've, we've talked a lot about people, or when we do inspections on people's properties, they tell us they want to transform their yard. Usually it's full of non-native plants, huge leaves that they just wanted to rip out and put something different. We have uh, encouraged, obviously, California native plants, but some residents have said that they want to look into gardening, but they have a smaller budget. So the next question here is uh, for residents on a smaller budget, but they do have the time, how can they create an edible garden? Yeah, I mean, the same principles apply in terms of looking at your space. What do you have? Do you have a yard? Do you have a patio? And check that sun. I can't emphasize that enough. That's the number one thing when we go to people's homes and we, you know, people send us pictures on the community garden DMs. When we go to schools, you think, oh, I have this space in the back of my patio, but it might not get any sun. So that's the first thing for anybody. Again, I'm just going to keep emphasizing that. But for smaller budgets and smaller spaces, um, you can look at the soil you have, you can try things like lasagna mulching or things like that, but that takes a lot of time to amend the soil. So you can mix in things like compost in a space if you have a smaller corner of your yard. Um, but also raised beds are not that hard to make. We have a video on our Monrovia Community Garden um, Facebook and Instagram page if you go to the video part that I actually did a tutorial in COVID that showed people how to really build a low cost raised bed. And it's really easy. And I know that the prices of wood have gone up, but if you use something like pine, you never want to use treated wood. Um, and then you just invest in that soil. Another thing you can do is get containers. You can ask at big box stores if there's any that are kind of like broken or chipped. Um, so that's a good tip in mm -hmm. terms of just seeing if there's ones that they're going to throw out anyways. Um, but there are actually containers that are really affordable. Um, and then invest in soil. And then I would say, don't go crazy with the plants. So one six pack of cucumbers for a household is just a few dollars. And if you go to, if you're driving, you know, we're, we're San Gabriel Valley focused today. Right. But if yeah, you just yeah. head down a little bit South on the 605, you'll see nurseries all over the place and don't hesitate to stop in and ask if they sell to the public. A lot of those are the same places that supply the box stores and the designer nurseries. So you can go to those spots and get six packs for just a couple dollars. Um, but you don't need to buy six, six packs, if that makes sense. You don't need that many cucumbers. <laughs> so if you can think of it in the six packs, get a pack of cucumbers, 
you know, if you get one pot, only one cucumber plant should be in that pot. So then you've got six cucumbers. So gardening actually is a really cost-effective way to build up eating more fruits and veggies. Um, and then like one tomato goes in one pot tomatoes, like deep, not wide. So remember that they like deep roots. So if you think of like cucumbers, tomatoes, you can, um, one of my favorite tips is herbs and green onions. I hate buying at the store because they're so cheap and easy to grow. You get a container, a packet of green onions. You just sprinkle those green onion seeds on the surface, kind of shimmy them in the dirt soil. I should not say dirt. It's always soil. Um, and then you'll have a supply of, you don't even have to thin them out. They just grow up in a bushel and you just take out those green onions as you need them. And that saves you a couple bucks every time, because how often are you using a whole thing of herbs or a whole thing of green onions? So herbs, green onions are great to grow on a budget and in pots. Um, and those are some of my tips. Thank you so much. And that's some good life pro tips right there. Some good uh, hacks as well. Uh, So in addition to visiting properties that have residents who want to start a garden, there are also those who have started a garden, but are noticing a lot of pests invade the yard. Um, Sometimes we do find a stumble upon uh, properties that have these gardens, but they have a lot of mosquito issues. And we, of course, tell them about not to over irrigate and to manage their irrigation practices. But for other types of pests, Um, This leads me to the next question, is that uh, people are surprised by the amount of pest control that needs to be done when starting and maintaining a garden. So what are some of your tips to reduce pests around the yard? So I have a follow-up question for you guys. What, when you go into people's yards and you're seeing this, what, can you name some of the specific pests you're seeing? Because I have some answers for sure, but I want to see if there's some, because pests range from like the tiniest, tiniest bacteria to your insects, to then like your critters. So I just want to make sure that I'm hitting So the question um, we usually get are focused on the, the different insects that they would sure. get that invade. And we obviously are specialized in the mosquitoes. Uh, yes. So we're able to address that, which many times can also have a domino effect of addressing other issues. Um, yes. But yeah, I guess insect pests would be okay. what I would focus on. Perfect, yeah. So I would say that we always are go-to for insect pests just to start out if we don't know what it is and something's munching, um, something that's non-toxic that breaks down um, is neem oil. So when we see kind of creepy crawlies or aphids, um, really a lot of different things, we just go ahead and do a treatment of neem oil. You can buy it pre-mixed or you can mix it yourself to save time and um, not, you don't save time mixing it yourself, but you save budget wise. <laughs> Um, it's not expensive. It's organic. It breaks down. It's not toxic. So that's a really good treatment that we just, that's our go-to. Um, another thing that I would say is use the iNaturalist app. And I think I have that later on here too, for education resources. But if you don't know what it is, that's a community citizen scientist, um, app that you can take a picture of what it is and, then people will feel that and be able to tell you, oh, that's such and such pest. And that's been especially helpful because I'm the vegetable person at our organization. I know the vegetables, but I don't know all the pests. I don't know all the trees. So it's really helpful to have something that you can go to and then be able to identify and then Google. Google's your friend. Yes. Um, So I would say neem oil and... um, The last thing I would say about pests is there comes a time in every season where the scales tip and there's aphids everywhere. That's when you know the season's over. So don't, you didn't fail, like nothing went wrong. (laughs) It's just time for that to go. Um, And that same thing happens, that happens a lot with like your broccolis, your cruciferouses, your kales, your cabbages. If someone can grow a Brussels sprout, let me know. I've never been able to. The aphids just take over. And then in the summer months, what we see is spider mites. So those look like webby things all over your plants and tomatoes. Um, And it's just time for them to come out. With all of these things, you can still eat the produce. And the last thing I would say is um, mildew. And that's, people think that that's something that lives on the leaves. It's actually a fungus on the plant. Um, So that's another thing that can just take over at the end of a season just pull it out. It's okay. Oh, good to know. Uh, if you're watching, this is the Bite Back Tour. We're talking with Kristen from Food Ed. 
And we're talking about mosquito-free uh, spring gardening. And hello to Society for Vector Ecology, SOV. You're watching us on Twitter and uh, as well as Public Health Maps on Twitter. If you have any questions or comments, please drop in into the comment box wherever you're watching, whether it's Twitter, Facebook, or YouTube. And this does bring us to our next question. Uh, what can parents do to get kids excited about creating healthy ecosystems that are beneficial to them and their community, which can include obviously the activity of gardening? Yeah. So I'm going to kind of flip this question back on you because kids are the ones that are generally really excited. Parents are the ones that really need to get excited. <laughs> so in terms of the hard sell, um, it's, and even when we go into schools, right, those young kids, they are so ready to look at bugs. They are so ready to flip over rocks. It's the teachers who've already made up their minds that they don't like gardening, not out of the teachers. We work with extraordinary teachers. So I should just say that. But, you know, they might not garden at home. They have a different hobby. That's totally fine. We're not in this to make everybody a gardener. But in terms of when we're talking about healthy ecosystems, um, I encourage families to just go explore. We've got amazing botanical gardens in the San Gabriel Valley, great resources, the Huntington, and even Dodger Stadium. I don't know if you all have followed up with them, but they have turned their parking lot and all of their plants into a certified botanical garden. So there's amazing things to get kids and families excited. Um, I already mentioned the iNaturalist app. So that's another thing. So when you're outside at a park on a hike, you know, technology can be a bridge sometimes too. You know, like we talk about screen free time. My family is an advocate of that. We've got some video game time happening too, but there's also good tools that we can use like the iNaturalist app. So the kids can take, my kids love it because they can take a picture. They run around our yard going, you know, and I, you know, most of the time I kind of know what something is, but who cares? Like they're engaging <laughs> with nature. Um, so that's a great way to get kids involved. And then I would say, check your community for workshops. Um, we have once a year do a family workshop. So we've got one coming up June 24th at the Monrovia Community Garden. And we do seed planting. We look at bugs. We do all kinds of stuff. I know there's stuff happening in Pomona, Lopez Farms. I know um, that different cities do different things at the parks. So there are a lot of stuff to get engaged with. It can almost be hard to keep up sometimes, but check your local community. And then I would say um, advocate at your schools for outdoor education. You know, talk to your principals, see what your gardening education looks like because it's a really, there's a few garden education companies in Los Angeles County. Um, and outdoor education, I was just with some kids this afternoon planting a tree and we were planting right outside the school gate. And the child said, oh, we're not at school anymore. We're not doing school. And I said, yes, we are, <laughs> this is learning. And the teacher said, you know, I wish we could do more outdoor learning. And, you know, they had our garden program in the fall. So we get the students for 12 weeks and then we have to meet with all the other classes. but. Um, what a great testament of like what learning is that we can be planting trees. And that is science. You know, what you guys do is science. And we want to see those career pathways and those kids know about what you're doing, what we're doing, that it all benefits a healthy ecosystem. Yeah, I really like how you target or flip it around so that it's the kids that get everyone else excited. And we see that too with our education mm -hmm. program. In fact, Pablo, if you want to just share that um, the microscope of the larva, Oh, and yeah. I'm sure that people who will be watching this who will uh, turn into kids themselves when they see something so different. Um, so Pablo's going to hook that up and show us real quick. It's well, and if really I can interrupt you, that we do the same thing with compost. So we have a microscope that we hook up at the schools and we show them what all the nematodes are and the tiny little things living in the compost too. So we should do a microscope night with you guys. Oh, no, yeah. absolutely. <laughs> we can definitely join forces and see what, what all the critters are in our soil and our water. Yeah. And so you know, something like this, we show a lot to the kids and they just either get grossed out, but mostly they get really excited. And just like the kids you educate, the students you educate, they end up going home and teaching their families. And sometimes in our case, they'll actually shame their parents for having stagnant <laughs> water around and um, all because they were really excited. So maybe they don't feel like they're in school, but they're always learning. Um, the kids know, like the kids are experts. We make our second graders our compost champions. And, mm -hmm. and like, at what point do we lose that? You know, like hopefully we yeah. can capture that and we're trying to build that K through 12 program so that it follows a kid just like sports would or music would. Mm. 
So um, science needs to do the same thing. We really need a strong science emphasis in our country. And so in terms of what this can do, it's just really what you guys are doing, what we're doing. We're just trying to encourage people to keep that kid-like exploration and curiosity, right? That they plant plants and get dirty and doesn't mean you're going to turn your home into a homestead like I did, and it, <laughs> um, but that you can appreciate it. Right. Today yeah. I told the class, you know, this is a cottonwood tree and, you know, none of them, they thought it was a cherry tree, you know, like we need to keep encouraging that curiosity of what these things are. Right. And we don't want the kids seeing this thinking it's a tadpole, but it's really a mosquito larva. Right. Totally. Um, yeah. And, and I think to add to that, the exciting part is, it's just bringing that whole aspect of science where sometimes it feels so out of touch or unattainable. You think like, oh, it's just a lab or you're dealing with chemicals or things. You know, science is right in our doorstep. It's right outside. Uh, And I think that's just so exciting. We see it all the time when our education specialists go to classrooms and students are just fascinated by looking under the microscope. And like, you know, these were literally just, you know, outside and bringing that into the classroom is so important. Mm Yeah. Yeah, and I also want to make mention here, if you are thinking about going to the LA County Fair, we will be there thanks to the partnership with Cal Poly Pomona, and we're also partnering with um, uh, California Botanic Gardens, the Theodore Payne Foundation, to bring some supplies and materials to show you about how to, to have mosquito-free gardening um, activities around your home and what to look for. Moving on to our next question. Um, I'm going to leave this larva so he can have his lunch <laughs> in peace here. Oh, yeah, as he's munching away. <laughs> Um, now, uh, next question targets more of the, the, uh, the teachers, how can teachers educate students about smart gardening without the mosquito bites? Yeah. So I would say what you guys are doing in homes, um, we actually work with a great organization called Amigos de los Rios, and they are huge advocates of what you all are doing and looking at vectors. And they like to take the students outside and look like your school's collecting water here. (laughs) You know, like there's a school that they just got a huge grant for in South Monrovia that's had a huge vector problem. But before they're going to do all that work, they show the students what's happening. So if there's water collecting, not even at your home, but at your school, you know, what's happening in those spaces. So as far as teachers, um, I really want to advocate, can we stop planting in plastic cups? (laughs) I don't know why, but every school we work at, and I mean, they do science in the classrooms. We're not, you know, the only holders of science education. (laughs) But there's these experiments that they run and I'm sure, you know, it would drive you guys nuts too, because it just ends up making these tiny little vectors all over the place because there's no drainage in those plastic cups. It's literally like the hard plastic Mm -hmm. cups Yep, yep. and they're watering them. And I just, I mean, next year I'm going to be like, I'm going to get you the proper containers. So (laughs) I think just having the proper containers, or if you're going to do gardening, just reach out to somebody who does this. You know, there's master gardeners in your community. There's organizations like ours in our community of like, how can I do this experiment? I think we get stuck in these ruts as teachers. And I was in higher education and a professor for 10 years. So I get it. Like you've had the lesson. It's in your wheelhouse. You're going to just going to pull out the plastic cups. You've got some leftover from last year, but just stop using the plastic cups and putting them outside. <laughs> um, And I mean, our teachers are doing a great job. So we just need to give it up to the teachers. You know, they're doing science education. They're aligning with next generation science standards. Um, So in terms of smart gardening, reach out to a garden education company because, you know, even today we're planting these native pollinator habitats for Monrovia pollinators in each of the schools. And so the fourth graders get a chunk of the garden to do this. And I'm getting trees today and I'm bringing plants today and we can't put that on our teachers. Right. Mm -hmm. So getting funding, encouraging, um, just outdoor education. If we can get kids outside and learning, we've seen all of the, you know, us department of education has studies on this. There's private studies on this of just saying how good it is for these kids to be outside. Um, smart gardening is engaged gardening. So being present, get outdoors, make sure your garden is taken care of year round. If it's not, talk to your district, talk to your administrators, talk to your school board because your school board sets the agenda. So our teachers know this, our teachers are educating. It's kind of the people behind the scenes of this question that we need to kind of push to fund these things, right? Schools have funding. California has a surplus of funding right now. So in terms of kind of helping out, if we could see healthy gardens in every school, we'd see healthier communities and healthier kids. 
it's not just a kid issue. It's a community wide issue of keeping kids, keeping enrollment up, um, all the things that California districts are facing right now, not saying gardening can cure it all, but maybe. (laughs) So in terms of this great state and we can have gardening year round, you know, why not invest more in science education and doing things? Um, And then in terms of just pest control um, and encouraging the kids plant different things, you know, when you do your monarch experiments or your grass experiments, why not try lavender? Why not try marigolds? Why not try arugula? You know, those things, once they flower and blossom and bloom, you're actually putting out a natural pest repellent. You have to plant a lot of it for that to work. You know, we're obviously not like making farms, but um, it's just good to teach kids about those things, smelling different things, getting their hands on different things. So um, teachers are doing a great job. Let's encourage our administrators and our districts to keep funding teachers. And um, if we can do those things, do wise watering. I just met with a district person this week because she didn't understand how irrigation was different in a garden than on a lawn. So if you've got people that are experts like you guys, like us that understand the difference, then we're not gonna have vector issues on our campuses, right? We're not gonna have big, huge puddles of water um, draining all different kinds of things. Bioswales, we need those, you know, we need to keep and capture our rainwater in really efficient ways. Mm -hmm. It keeps it in our communities um, and helps our gardens grow better. So. Um, I'm, I'm here to support the teachers. I love the teachers. I love the schools we work with. So, um, yeah. And yeah, same here. We, our programs cannot, our education programs cannot succeed the way it has without our teachers in San Gabriel Valley. They're, they are the ones that are our champions and we want to make sure we recognize them every chance we get. And they definitely pull through and making sure that their students are outdoors learning and experiencing the natural world. And that's what we want. And that will eventually help us create you know, more uh, increased biodiversity, healthier environments, and less mosquitoes overall. Right. Uh, this does bring us to our closing remarks of our episode. Um, just check, make sure on our social media feeds if there are no questions. If you're watching right now, you're watching the Bite Back Tour. We're with Kristen from Food Ed. And you're watching on Facebook, Twitter, or YouTube. Feel free to drop in a comment or question. And right now we'll move into closing remarks. Um, I just want to remind everyone that uh, we have another episode coming up next month. Pablo, I think there might be a slide on this one if you, if yes. you can share. And it's a, it ties in very well to um, Pet Month. I think it's, uh, yeah, Family Pet Month next month. And we will talk more about healthy homes and happy pets. So a little more focus on our four-legged friends, how we can keep them, help, uh, keep them happy and healthy uh, without bringing in the bites. And, and also just a reminder to everyone to please remember to tip, toss, and protect yourself. So tip out stagnant water, um, toss out any unused containers. Please don't keep using those plastic cups if you can help it and um, protect yourself with repellent. Uh, I know D has been a gold standard for a while, but there are alternatives. Oil of lemon eucalyptus is actually very effective. It's also known as PMD uh, if you look for it on the shelves. Uh, and then there's another item or ingredient called picaridin. That's been up and coming as an alternative to DEET and it's really popular in Europe. And it, I like that one the best. Uh, for me, oil, lemon eucalyptus is a little too strong in terms of smell, uh, but a lot of people love it. Uh, it does derive itself from natural uh, plants. And of course there's IR3535. It's kind of like the underdog of our ingredient list for repellents, um, but it's also out there and available. So we have options to keep you bite free because in the cities where we live, We cannot eliminate every single mosquito, but we can reduce them by being smart about how we garden, how we live our lives, and how we landscape and change our outdoor space. So that's my closing remark. Um, Pablo or Anita, if you want to jump in with any other closing remark before we move to Kristen. I'll just jump in really quick on your repellent messaging, Levy, and something that Luce uh, from Sacramento Yolo uh, shared with us on our Instagram live earlier this week is when it comes to mosquito repellent, the most important thing is that you have one that works for you and that you use it. Uh, Making sure you're following the label, applying and reapplying as needed. And especially as we enter our hot hot summer months, uh, making sure you're using your sunscreen and then your mosquito repellent. That's the best way to make sure we're protecting ourselves from the sun and mosquitoes that are most active uh, during our summer months. So making sure you get your mosquito repellent and using it. You can go, Kristen. 
Oh, great. Well, I just wanted to say thank you to all of you for this bite back tour. It's been an, um, really fun partnering with you guys and I made it through Pueblo without coughing. <laughs> <laughs> yes, <Yay>. success. <laughs> choke, I didn't choke myself. So, um, but yeah, thank you for all you guys are doing for our communities. Uh, I love the communities in San Gabriel Valley. It's a really fun and unique place to live. And even though we're in different cities, it feels like, you know, we've got this kind of 210 corridor, 605 corridor where we can meet great community partners like you guys. Um, we love what we do at Food Ed. Feel free to reach out to us at any time. Our website is explorefooded.org. Um, we're on Instagram and Facebook at Explore Food Ed. Um, that's our handle. Um, and then this Saturday, actually, two days from now, we have a free tomato workshop, and that will be at the Monrovia Community Garden in Monrovia. It's free and open to the public. And I have a lot of free tomatoes to give away. So if anybody's interested in that, that is on April 23rd at 10 a.m., at Monrovia Community Garden. And we do um, workshops in our communities. We're doing a lot with compost and food waste. So if you guys ever want to talk about that, that's a whole other <laughs> a whole other Zoom workshop. <laughs> oh, yes, absolutely. I think this won't be the last of our partnership because um, we have a lot of overlap between our industries and mm -hmm. a lot of good information to educate yeah. the public and families and make San Gabriel Valley a healthier place to live. Yeah, go science. Yes. <laughs> yes. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you all so much for watching. This is the Bite Back Tour and stay safe, stay healthy and stay 